30 to 50% of your fractures produce 80% of your hydrocarbons. That lends a lot of credibility. You know, if you come in and can be upfront and honest and say, you know, actually in this application, I think this product over here that I don't represent will be better for you than that. All of a sudden, now you become a trusted advisor rather than a salesman. And, you know, I often say that we have uh, all the requirements of space, right? Because it has to go underground and send us data from, from miles and miles away. And it has to work. Like, failure is not an option. Uh, we'll put on, you know, a standard meal shoe. Ours is slightly different just for that. But it's, you know, everybody's got one. The top drive and the drawers really don't care whether the electrons coming at it are from a joystick or a PLC. The, the panel, what you see here on the left, which is uh, now controlled by uh, one of my students, uh, is showing you actually uh, the control of our brakes. As of now, geothermal is a pretty small, pretty small market. If you have torch velocity, the, uh, the casing will be up against the side on part of the well. There won't be any cement there. The cement will have crescent around it. So managed pressure drilling, it's been defined as a process to precisely control the pressure profile in the well bore. The key is being transparent with our clients in, in this case. So tell them what happened. If we had a failure, tell them exactly what happened. It, whether it's our fault, whether it's what, whatever the issue was, we need to yeah. be transparent. But I think it's very important for everyone in the industry to know what's out there and kind of what's happening down hole as well. I've probably worked on over 40 different performance limiters in my career. If I miss any of those and a computer is raising weight on bit and I miss any of those, I have a train wreck. The computer's going in the ocean. Here's your new colors, here's your new thing. Go do here's that. Here's the itself. tattoo you need to get. Yeah, here's the tattoo. Sorry about the last one. Um, <laughs> We used to fake that all the time. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Welcome to the B Lock Miss Door. <laughs> I can't say it. B Door Locksmith. V Door Locksmith. There we go. My mic was muted. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the V Door Locksmith Show. I'm your host, David Gibson. So excited for y'all to be here with us. We are unlocking the secrets to success in the oil and gas industry. One interview, one technical presentation, and one technical screw up at a time. So, uh, don't know what the technical script will be today, but I'm sure we will find it because we're doing a new setup that we've never done before. Uh, so hopefully everybody out there watching, uh, will be very mindful and let me know anytime I do screw up, uh, guys, let me know where y'all are watching from guys and gals. Let us know where you guys are watching from. Love to be able to give everybody a shout out, uh, here at the beginning of the show. We do appreciate everybody like share, subscribe, follow us on, uh, LinkedIn, Tag a friend in the comment section. Do something to help the show. Hit the like button. I mean, there's like 30-something-ish people or whatever watching right now. It helps out a lot. If you just you just scroll over and you go, boop, like that right there. And you just go on the little thing. So uh, do appreciate it. All right. So let's get to saying hi to everybody. Martin Fart, guy that I actually worked with out in the field. Uh, tuning in from Midland County. Thanks for being here. Uh, Amin says, morning. We've got Ian tuning in from the Woodlands. Thank you for being here, sir. John DeWart says, good morning to the B. Smith Locks Door Show. From Rainy, Colorado. That's exactly right. That's the show for today. Uh, Calvin Holt tuning in. Uh, it's better. I feel better. It's raining. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I said good morning to everybody. Yeah. And then we've got Pete Stetson from the deep team uh, tuning in from Dallas. For whatever reason, his partner didn't show up to work today. So I guess we're going to take over that office a little bit later. David Hicks tuning in from Oklahoma. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, Kanat from Kazakhstan. All right. Love having the international flavor here to the show. Uh, Hunter tuning in from Midland. Focus, please. Focus. Is it not focused? Oh, that doesn't look good. Internet, it must be running slow. All right. Let's do this. Then. File, save, close this out. I don't know why. 
Tracy, are you on the internet? There? Let me turn my phone off of the Wi Fi. Not on the Wi Fi on my phone. Okay. I did this yesterday during SPE. What's that? Well, hopefully it'll focus. I don't know if it will. Ah. All right. Anyways, Bobby tuning in from H Town, John Bitself. I'm saying hello from Spicewood, somewhere between Midland and Austin. Hmm. Somewhere between Midland and Austin. Obviously not at work today. Uh, it says, good morning from Austin, Texas. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, tuning in from Fort Worth, my hometown. Uh, Tia's tuning in from Scotland. And Mauricio tuning in from Katy, Texas. Thank you for being here, sir. Y'all got to let me know if it's okay. Uh, is it going to work? LinkedIn stopped working on my phone, so now I can't even see. Tracy, would you check and see on your phone if uh, if it's uh, coming in clear now? Yes. Come on. There we go. We'll keep saying hi to everybody. All right. Brian Dugas tuning in from Bowbridge as per normal. All right. Five? Five? Tuning in from uh, Saudi Arabia this morning. Thank you for being here, sir. Do appreciate it. Uh, uh, Sami, tuning in from Carlsbad. And then Sadiq, tuning in from Oman. Definitely got uh, from Oman, Dubai. It's like, that's two different places, though. Probably right there in the middle, maybe near, near the border, the travel or something. All right, awesome. Thank you guys all so much for being here. I do appreciate it. All right, on to the next thing that we normally do here with the show. All right, let me see. Do we have this? That's already done. If I added it to the stream, I have not. Share screen. Uh oh. Actually, we can do this. Boom. There we go. All right. As per normal. Oh, hold on. Keith Stelter's tuning in from Odessa. Thanks, Keith, for being here. All right. Uh, so this week, uh, as per normal, we've got. Oh, I just broke it. Um, We've got an amazing partner here with the show, Corva. So if you can, please, if you want to win yourself a drill bit, this one's gold, and I just broke part of it. Oh, we've got a chipped cutter now. All right. So if you would like to win yourself a drill bit, this one happens to be gold. It was running, doing some special stuff. There we go. Crash that Corva. Type in hashtag Corva for your chance to be able to win one of these drill bits. Uh, special thanks. Uh, to a couple of people, especially David Hicks, uh, he posted his, uh, uh, we sent a couple of them out this week. He posted his online. Really do appreciate that. Uh, so type in hashtag Corva. And this is your, make sure I do this right. This is your Corva Insight of the Week. Over the last decade, several companies in the industry have pursued drilling automation. Drilling automation has many different definitions, but generally it can be described as the automation of various drilling processes, including but not limited to well design, real-time well trajectory, well control, and rig operations. Automating these processes lead to safer, more efficient, and reliable drilling operations. The advancement of computing, electrical, and mechanical systems have made it possible to implement advanced solutions that effectively automate the drilling processes. Several technical sections and industry committees are operated under SPE that engage leaders in the petroleum and other industries to advance the frontier of drilling technologies. Some of these technical sections are Drilling System Automation Technical Section or DSATS. You will hear about this in today's video logs with. Other such technical sections are well both positioning technical section and drilling uncertainty prediction technical section. All these sections routinely organize webinars, tech talks, workshops, and competitions to engage the oil and gas community in driving the conversation forward. They also operate various steering committees run by industry experts to standardize drilling processes and calculations. Please check out SP technical sections and join the communities to be part of the drilling automation movement.
All right, now I'm not on mute. All right, thank you guys so much. That was your Corva Insight of the Week. Thank you so much to Corva for uh, being a partner to the show. So if you haven't already, be sure to type in hashtag Corva, and we will do the drawing now. All right, here we go. Just lost it. What did we what, what? Just lost it. What do you mean? Oh, no. Okay, here we go. Let's add this one to the stream. There we go. Put me down here. All right. We've got 18 drawings and 18 submissions this week. That's great. All right, here we go. For whoever the winner is going to be. Drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. And this week's winner is... Vod, Vod Sagir? Vod Sagir. All right, you're the winner this week. So shoot me a DM. Uh, with your name and address and information, and we will get this set over to you immediately, sir. All right. Now I got to take this off. Whoa. Oh, my. I'm looking at the mouse on this one because I'm sharing my screen, so that's not how to be able to do it. All right. There we go. All right. Now, so we can read. That's done. That's done. I can close that out. There we go. Okay, like I said, this is a new way of being able to do the show. So here with me in studio, even though it looks like I'm doing a remote setup, is actually Dr. Pradeep Ashok. Yeah, there we go. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey, nice to be here. All right, everybody. So actually, I need to be looking over at this camera. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm actually going to step to the side. He wants to be able to give a technical presentation on AI and machine learning. So I'm get a step out of the way and then let him be able to run everything right here. So if you guys have any questions as we're going through, be sure to put them into the comment section. Uh, we'll handle all of y'all's questions uh, probably at the end or as we're going through, if you guys have questions and stuff, if we see them pop up, uh, uh, pretty can answer them as, as we're going. Um, so yeah, like I said, this is the first time doing this uh, and doing the show like this. So thank you so much for being here. I'll step out of the way and let you, take over so we'll go back over to camera one hopefully you'll go into focus pretty quick there we go and then we'll uh we'll do that one right there click there and then all you gotta do is there we go it's all you okay great thanks david um because david wanted to go do an interview for an hour but uh uh i was not going to give him that right so uh uh we need to really kind of, you know, get this industry moving in AI. So I thought, you know, why not uh, give a short presentation, uh, give everybody a little bit of uh, uh, insights from my experience over the years, and then we can go into kind of a free flowing interview. So, uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, today in the next 20 minutes is on uh, AI and machine learning and some guidelines for deploying them on the field actually working AI. Uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, so everybody knows uh, AI, uh, at least the non-fictional version, is able to do some tasks better than humans. And, and this is seen uh, uh, all over uh, in other industries. So that's, that's essentially uh, what makes AI so attractive to drilling, is that, hey, you know, let's find out something where it does the task better than humans. So so that's, that's essentially the goal with AI. Now, AI includes machine learning, and it also implies algorithms and models that are actually coded by humans and learned using data. Let me just check on that. So, uh, so this presentation is gonna be a lot of, uh, uh, you can say kind of, you know, nuggets, insights. So uh, all kind of, you know, pieced together. So. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of this presentation, you would have learned something uh, that you didn't know before. So when you talk about building an AI model, there are broadly two approaches. One is what people say or call shallow machine learning. So here what you do is basically uh, you have some data. You manually select what features you want to kind of you know, put into the model, and then you basically train the data on those features to get your model. Okay, so that's what generally is called shallow machine learning. It's, uh, it's a manual work, it's time consuming. And on the other hand, you have deep machine learning, where basically uh, you just give the data and it learns all the features and builds a model for you. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, it does everything for you. 
this is more of a black box. Yeah, click it again. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so, so, so that's on a high level the two broad approaches. Now, uh, machine learning as a field has been there for close to more than a, a half a century. So, uh, over these years, people have come up with tons of different methods to basically train your data and get a model that predicts something. So the key challenge with using a machine learning model is to figure out of using a machine learning uh, algorithm is to figure out what model to use. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. That's something uh, I see that a lot of people don't give due attention to most of the times. Uh, at least the students, they, they gravitate towards the, the flashiest model that got released in 2021, 2022. Uh, they don't give too much uh, of a thought. So hopefully uh, this presentation will kind of you know, tell you what you need to look at. So everybody knows AI has trust issues, right? Um, you would not generally kind of, you know, trust AI with your life. You would and you would get in a Tesla. There are some people who might sleep while the Tesla is driving, but for the most part, People still don't want to die uh, in a Tesla. So AI still has stress issues. And so uh, why is this, right? So basically, it's primarily because when stakes are high, people don't want to trust a black box. And so that's where model understandability becomes necessary. And model understandability kind of facilitates, of course, you know, debugging. So uh, let's say uh, the Tesla did go hit something. Uh, if you're able to figure out why it hit something or somebody, then you're able to debug it, and uh, and that helps. Uh, similarly, uh, if your Tesla does something bad, you're able to kind of you know figure out uh, if there's a bias in the algorithm and if it needs to be fixed. So uh, so in the previous slide, I, I kind of you know talked about a lot of different models, right? So basically, when you have when you build an AI system. One of the key things that you need to keep in mind is model understandability. Now, uh, again, uh, on this slide, uh, again, there's a broad notion of model understandability, which is that um, the more complex the models are, for example, uh, uh, if it's a deep uh, uh, neural network, there's a general, un general notion that it's more accurate. And uh, the less uh, black boxy, uh, the models are, for example, distant tree. Uh, there is uh, a notion that uh, they can explain things better, but they're not as accurate. So, but this is not always true, and uh, there actually uh, it's a it's a debate that is ongoing in the research community. In fact, Cynthia Rudin from uh, Duke University, she kind of you know says that you know uh, there's a widespread belief that the complex models are more accurate. Meaning that you know, if you build a complicated black box model, it'll be the best. But this is not true, especially when uh, there's a good representation uh, of the model in the data. And so, uh, and also, uh, a lot of times you may build uh, a, an understandable model, which can be improved over time uh, through the uh, uh, by getting feedback, and that makes them oftentimes more. Uh, accurate than essentially a black box model. So, so a little bit about model understandability, right? So, essentially, uh, uh, if you look at this particular uh, uh, line here, you'll see that uh, really there are two kinds of you know uh, models, or two kind of you know people kind of you know, put it into two uh, boxes: interpretable AI and explainable AI, and and decision trees. Uh, linear regression, all of these kind of you know fall into kind of you know interpretable models, and then there are explainable models. Explainable AI is is a, is a relatively new concept. So let's kind of you know just just briefly kind of you know touch base on this before I start going into examples. So uh, so building interpret inherently interpretable predictive models is one way to kind of enhance model understandability. So if you look at this, there's a decision tree here, and essentially a uh, uh, you can see that you know if your age is less than 40 and you eat a lot of pizza it's it's all right uh but if you're over 40 uh then you know uh, things change right so basically if you're over 40 you don't do exercises and then you know it's not really good and and this is a model 
right? That anybody can look at and understand. Whereas a uh, black box models usually don't have that kind of, you know, interpretability. But even for black box models, you can actually build what people call an explainer. So basically you have a black box model, you put some inputs, you get some outputs, you put a whole lot of inputs, get a whole lot of outputs, and you can build a simpler explainer that basically explains the black box model. So, uh, so that's going on right now. So, uh, uh, and again, understand the model understandability is not always needed. Sometimes when, when the model doesn't have to kind of, you know, predict uh, something that uh, has a serious consequences or if it's been validated extensively. Okay, so now to, uh, uh, to a lot of examples, basically uh, uh, in drilling to kind of, you know, get you kind of, you know, situated. So, so this presentation kind of, you know, started with the fact that essentially uh, uh, AI and machine learning, uh, it ultimately boils down to you choosing a model and training the data on that model so that you can use it. So oftentimes uh, the biggest issues that we see in AI is that people don't give due time or consideration to the model. Uh, the focus is not on basically uh, what to choose. They just choose the, uh, choose the one that uh, comes to their mind. So here, this is an example uh, again, uh, where the, we had a recent competition uh, that was organized by SPDUPTS on uh, uh, bit image processing. Uh, basically, you take bit images and kind of uh, arrive at uh, conclusions, or the software arrives at conclusions as to what happened to the bit. And of course, this uh, slide shows some of the research that we did at our university, UT Austin, uh, but this should help explain the concepts. This particular uh, problem use two different machine learning models okay so so you can see first you know here basically what we do is take the images mm -hmm. uh, find the cutters grade the cutters find out the location of the cutters and then with all of this information we are trying to tell what caused that damage on that bed so here of the two models the first model that we used is basically a convolutional neural network and this is essentially a deep learning model and this is a black box. So essentially, uh, uh, what you see here is essentially the goal is to find these cutters. And so uh, here, uh, like I said, we use a deep learning technique. And these are all different deep learning models that we could use. And I will not go into why we chose that particular uh, deep learning model right now, but, but we chose that. And so here, the key idea is the key thing to kind of note that uh, it's very difficult to manually extract features from this image to find the cutters, right? So a shallow machine learning uh, algorithm would not generally work. And also uh, here, model understandability is not that important because, hey, you know, uh, your, your model, you know, it found, you know, uh, 80 out of 84 cutters, that's good enough. Uh, with that, you can get enough insights. Uh, there's nothing bad that's gonna happen if the model actually kind of you know predicts a little bit uh, off, so this works well for this particular case. Now, uh, on the other hand, once you get the cutters, the locations, now you got to tell whether the damage happened because of wall stick slip uh, or you know bit bounce, right? So here, now if you had a black box, uh, I mean uh, even between uh, bit experts. Uh, there's varying kind of you know uh, uh, ideas on what causes what kind of dysfunction causes what kind of damage. So there's no agreement yet. So here it is a good idea to build a model such as a decision tree, which though it's simple, is expl easily explainable. Mm -hmm. So that when this does provide an output, the experts have a means to kind of you know, trace why the algorithm came up with that uh, output. And in fact, you know. Uh, if, if there's consensus, they can actually work on refining and changing the model. So this is a, this is a very simple example of uh, uh, essentially a, uh, how you would choose a model so that people use it. So of course, uh, uh, we'll go into uh, accuracy, right? So basically, first I uh, wanted to cover the fact that understandability. So before you build a model, think about whether the model needs to be explained to the end user. If it needs to be explained to the end user, come up with a plan. 
Now, next, let's go into accuracy, right? So few, few important uh, points. Can we know how accurate a prediction would be? The answer is no. We can only know how accurate it was because uh, the accuracy that gets reported for different machine learning algorithms was on data that you basically trained on. You have a test set. Yes, but you know, that's it. You know, you cannot say how accurate a future prediction would be. Now, so, so is accuracy, you know, the more just an academic exercise? No, that's not true either. So more accuracy is good, right? So basically if you had 10 different models to choose from and that satisfied all of your other criteria, then yes, accuracy is important. Now, yeah, accuracy is an easy metric that we all can, can compute and optimize. So that's generally, it's, it's, a, it's a lazy person's kind of an approach, hey, you know, my model is more accurate than yours. Um, metrics such as user engagements are very difficult to quantify. Like if you were to build this model, will somebody use it? Or is it just gonna be kind of, you know, on your computer, on some GitHub repository, kind of, you know, waiting for years for somebody to kind of, you know, even take a look at it. So, uh, so think about accuracy from that sense. And uh, this, I mean, the next uh, two slides, a quick example to kind of you know, show why, why, uh, I would kind of you know, caution you on just you know, sticking to accuracy. There's a project that we did at UT. Uh, basically, uh, we had uh, a pretty big data set that, uh, that looked into mud motor failures. And essentially, uh, we had surface data and we had information whether the mud motor failed or not. Uh, and this was primarily elastomer failures. And so, uh, what we did was we tried various different uh, algorithms, right? Logistic regression, uh, the naive base, addition trees, and of course uh, the recent kind of you know popular ones, random forest, XG boost, and uh, so we did. So, so we we trained the data on those models. They were all kind of you know more or less kind of you know in the same ballpark, some better than the other, and we found out you know basically through uh, uh, permutation importance, you know the features that basically were most relevant. And we saw, hey, you know, high impact spikes uh, really had an effect on mud motor failure. Uh, back reaming time had, you know, uh, an, an effect and, you know, transitioning from rotary to slide drilling also had an effect. And, and we are happy, right? It's a good model, you know, but, you know, a, a few things that this model kind of, you know, uh, lacks or, you know, didn't take into account is the fact that, hey, we had no information about the mud motor specs. So we don't know what kind of fit uh, it was capable of. We have no Im information about the temperature rating. We have no Im uh, information about uh, whether the uh, uh, one motor was drilled in a high temperature environment. So, uh, uh, so all of that can basically kind of, you know, totally derail this model, right? So coming up with an accuracy saying, hey, this model had an accuracy of 97% means nothing because at the end of the day, uh, if there was a high temperature situation or if there was a strange kind of a mud motor, this, this model just wouldn't work. And, and imagine this model telling, hey, the, the motors failed, pull out, and, and they pull it out, and, uh, and basically, no, there's nothing wrong, right? Uh, somebody's going to get fired or run off. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, 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 so accuracy, you know, uh, uh, Important, but but not so much. Now this is really important. So basically, uh, uh, data, real time data that we get in the field, uh, that always bad data, and you know, basically a lot of times the sensor data is missing. So uh, and I see a lot of you know people complaining that hey you know we got to fix the data right yeah uh, for sure we have to fix mm -hmm. the data, but uh, but if you kind of you know wait for the data to be fixed you probably wait for another half a century. So uh, it's a better thing to make your model handle missing data. And, and there are many ways to do that, actually. So, so don't complain that, you know, data is bad. This is just one example. This is, a, this is a Bayesian network machine learning model. And here, you know, the way it's done is that, you know, there is a state called unknown. So basically it means that uh, you're not able to calculate that. And then it uses other features to kind of you know, figure out if you know a full stick is happening. And different machine learning models have different ways to handle missing data. So make sure that if you're building a model, 
that it can handle missing data. Then uh, uh, another thing that uh, when you build a model, you've got to think about is extensibility. So, uh, so again, you know, one certainty about, uh, yeah, one certainty about data is that you'll always have more data, right? Uh, when you start drilling a, a new field, uh, as you drill more wells in that new field, you're getting more data. And also new sensors are being deployed all the time. So you're also gonna get new sensor data. So uh, if your model uh, is not able to essentially uh, kind of uh, have uh, data from the get go, uh, yeah, basically it's, it's, not, it's not able to handle uh, uh, or it's not, it's not being built to kind of you know, handle new information, then you are at a disadvantage. So basically keep that in mind. So this is again, uh, another example, again, kind of, you know, uh, just a, uh, a Bayesian network here. You know, one of the models that was first built was basically a uh, forward loss gain. Uh, you know, it's a general model, it takes in, you know, uh, pump pressure, flow out, uh, I think delta flow, rig activity. And then, you know, recently another source of data became available, which is basically the drilling memos. And so, this is one way in which uh, you are able to kind of you know, add new uh, features to the model easily to kind of uh, extend your model. And so this makes sure that you know as uh, your model kind of you know, stays current. So uh, uh, this is this is uh, I guess you know primarily for uh, uh, a lot of the students kind of you know uh, at the universities, right? When you when you write machine learning uh, programs, uh, treat them as like a software project. Uh, don't just write some code kind of, you know, that basically is, is very rudimentary. Uh, it'll actually increase the odds of a longer life for your model. And, and that basically means that, you know, you basically build it so that uh, as you get feedback from testing industry, you're able to maintain it and essentially kind of, you know, it transitions to the next person. Because, because one general thing kind of just to keep in mind is that nobody wants to kind of, you know, keep writing the same or work on the same kind of, you know, problem for five years, right? So basically uh, uh, somebody's working on a kick detection problem, right? Uh, maybe they'll spend like a year, two on that, but after that they want to go on to, you know, a stuck by problem. So, uh, so you've got to make sure that the software that you're writing is easily transferable to another person. So with that, just a, a, a summary of the guidelines. So, uh, the key things are do not let accuracy be the sole guiding factor when choosing your uh, AI models. So it's, it's important, but it can be very misleading. And it's okay to miss events. So, you know, uh, if you're writing an algorithm that basically uh, uh, is, is detecting how much a bit has damage or whether a mud motor has is damaged, it's okay to miss it. But costly, you know, false even flags, and if you're saying that the, the drill bit is, is fully damaged, uh, they will not be tolerated. And if they do trip out because of your uh, software, uh, that'll be the last time your software is run uh, by those people. So, um, uh, model understandability can be very important. And, and this may basically, uh, again, make or break, break deployments, right? Because our industry does not tolerate software you know that does not work right they may give it uh, one two three trials if it doesn't work within that it's out so if you are able to explain your model to the uh, uh, end user you stand a better chance because you can tell hey this is why it did it and let me change it and you know please try again models should account for missing and bad data so uh, that's a uh, that's a straightforward thing you know don't blame data uh, model extensibility is important. So, uh, so don't build models that are difficult to kind of, you know, add new features to or, uh, or, uh, new kind of, you know, data channels. Uh, and, and some of the models, the black box models, I, I, I can understand that, you know, it may be kind of, you know, uh, not that easy, but have a pipeline where when new data comes, you know, there's a plan for actually retraining the model and you have the old data as well. So, so think about uh, think about that before you kind of you know, start your project. 
and then of course you know basically uh, uh, apply continuous uh, improvement cycles uh, to your models right so that basically uh, uh, put it into the field or put it into practice get back uh, new information on how it's doing and then make changes and uh, most of the models they get better over time so for example google search they did come up with a really good uh, search engine but uh, but they continuously continue to innovate right today's google search is not the same that they came up with and and so basically the only way that you can stay ahead uh, with your model is to continuously refine it uh, last slide of course you know uh, uh, university research is uh, is heavily dependent on, of course, you know, our sponsors. So we thank uh, all of our sponsors at Rapid, which is basically the uh, uh, the rig automation and performance improvement and drilling consortium at UT Austin uh, for supporting a lot of this research. And and this uh, this slide, of course, shows our 2022 sponsors. There's been a whole lot of other sponsors from 2015 onwards, and and we thank them as well, even though uh, uh, they are not mentioned on these slides. So with that. Uh, I'm happy to kind of uh, take questions, um, and uh, All right. David, I'll take from there. Or? Yeah, here, I'll, or I'll switch spots, and then I'll uh, okay. put it on. All right, let's see if I come in focus now, and put it back on that one. All right, so first question that we had come up while you were presenting, and this one actually came up uh, fairly early, which was, how will field hands adopt to working with AI? Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, it takes a lot of training uh, and uh, it starts with training the drilling engineers in the office uh, on how the AI works, which is why uh, I kind of you know placed a lot of importance on model understandability, right? Because when you go to a, a drilling engineer and say, hey, this, this magic box kind of, you know, will automatically kind of, you know, tell you if a stuck pipe is happening or not, uh, they say, okay, you know, you can show it to me on some kind of, you know, data sets, but they still would hesitate taking that to the field because their reputation, their credibility is on the line. So you have to, that's why, uh, at least in drilling, you have to be able to explain what it does, show that it works to the drilling engineer. Then along with the drilling engineer, right, uh, if uh, he or she has a good rapport with the field people, talk about what exactly this AI engine does, and then get it there, right? And uh, uh, and and do kind of you know tell them some key things like you know um, uh, this AI engine will not take over your job or your responsibilities completely. Uh, it will help you. So basically, you know, uh, uh, it may help catch some washouts. It may help catch some stuck pipe events. It won't help you catch everything, but it'll help catch some. And so. Through that, mm -hmm. basically, it eventually you'll save money because it at least helped catch some of them. So that's essentially how uh, you'll have to kind of you know explain it to uh, uh, the field personnel, and you got to make you got to break it down into simpler, I mean, in, into simpler kind of you know visuals and such. But that's the that's how you do it. Do you see a point in time where more field hands will be hands on in the the AI process, whether it's like helping to get new data, helping to be able to train, to be part of that feedback loop per se with the system so that the system can get better. Like if they see something and be like, hey, I saw something that it should have picked up, but it didn't. Is that is that being integrated into like the process of what y'all are doing? Yeah, yeah, no, no, uh, definitely. So so two things, two points <clears throat> on that. So one, you know, basically uh, uh, as the field personnel become, I mean, uh, like five years back was different. Right. So now people are beginning to kind of, you know, warm up to the idea that, hey, there's an AI stuff, you know, that could help. Right. And they do kind of, you know, report back to the drilling engineers that, hey, you know, this is what it said. And they try to kind of you know, figure out and we do get, you know, a lot of feedback saying, hey, no, you need to maybe change this like this so that, you know, for example, hey, the washout was detected. But then, you know, uh, after that, you know, it just left us kind of, you know, trying to figure out what to do. Right. Maybe you could kind of, you know, say, hey, washout's detected and, you know, it's continuing to kind of, you know, worsen, right? So those kind of things, we do get feedback and so that we can refine it. But uh, uh, we are actually kind of, you know, moving, uh, like I kind of, you know, mentioned, uh, we are moving into using the driller memos, right? Uh, 
into the AI engines. So if the driller types in things like, you know, basically, you know, it transferred the pit, right? Or basically, you know, there was a pump sweep. We can use that to kind of say, hey, there was a pump sweep. So maybe that signal is not washed out, right? So so those kinds of things. So and and so basically, driller memos is really uh, 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 good in the sense that, you know, they can type whatever they type, right? That's taken into account. So now we are actually reaching a stage where they can ask questions and the AI engine can reply back. So, uh, so it is, of course, you know, you know, basically kind of like, you know, uh, Alexa and, you know, Siri and stuff, right? But on a, on a very, on a basic level, right? So now the question is, you know, uh, will, of course, the drillers use it, right? So there's, there's still kind of, you know, some work that needs to be done, but at least uh, the drillers uh, 10 years from now won't feel like, you know, they are drilling in an antiquated kind of, you know, uh, fashion. So what, what kind of question could they ask? Would it be like, you know, uh, Hey, rig computer, can I add more weight? Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> or... yeah so, uh, so, so exactly, you know, can I add more weight? Or, you know, it could be something like, you know, uh, uh, tell me what happened in the previous shift, right? Uh, like, you know, uh, so, so, th so those are you know, some, of the, some of the ideas, right? I mean, and people can come up with, you know, uh, creative kind of, you know, questions to basically ask and kind of, you know, get feedback on. It doesn't have to be super complicated. Of course, yeah. you know, you can have, you know, super complicated, like, uh, it, 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 Things like you know, hey, you know, uh, is there a potential for a hole cleaning problem, right? Something okay. as simple as yeah. that, right? Uh, they can ask. Of course, they can look at the data and find it. But hey, you know, if you had to just kind of you know ask and get some response, right? Uh, uh, kind of you know, it takes AI a little bit more forward, and people start kind of you know getting the feel that their machine is capable of doing something. And of course, you know, it'll improve over time, right? I mean, yeah. nobody expects you know, uh, okay, Google and Siri to kind of you know to be good from the get go, right? But they've improved over time, so. So in, in, in AI improving over time, what helps to be able to accelerate that? Is it more data? Is it more training scenarios? Is it um, a better quality of data? Like what helps to be able to, you know, go from, you know, the, the start and saying, okay, yeah, we, like we were able to, you know, pick up one incident, but we had, you know, five false flags right um versus you know five ten years down the road to where you're like you know we were able to pick up you know 10 incidents and only have one false flag or no false flags yeah 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 no no more more data definitely helps right so so more data will help more feedback helps the most right when when uh, because a lot of times ai systems are deployed on the field and if it doesn't work uh, the feedback doesn't kind of you know come to the uh, people who are actually working on the algorithms right so if that does come, then the people who work on the algorithms can figure out how next time that event happens, uh, uh, you are able to kind of you know, make it better. And uh, most AI systems, they become better over time. So uh, so you cannot generally expect to you know, hey, you build an AI <laughs> engine and you put it on the field and basically you know, day one, it's doing all this magic, right? So uh, uh, longevity, right? I mean, if, if you can have, so basically a lot of the companies, right? I mean. Uh, as long as they can maintain their model over years, right, uh, and kind of you know continue to refine it, it will become better. Uh, just uh, a few days back, I, I did see kind of you know uh, a paper on convolutional neural network for stuck pipes, right, 2007, right, mm -hmm. uh, and this is 2022, right. So what happened to it, right? Uh, so a lot of times the AI models, right again, just becomes an academic exercise, you know, they're like, oh, you know, we build a model, some data, you know, we publish, you know, we go to the next thing, right? Yeah. Uh, AI models will become better when they get actually deployed. And there is a team that constantly kind of, you know, works to improve it. And, and this improvement should be over, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So you have to kind of, you know, think about AI models from that time frame. Not 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 like a two year time frame. And I noticed you said in the your presentation, what was it? Uh, extensibility, right? And be able to add on to it. Is it are is it part of the process to be able to say like, okay, there might be new methodologies that come up as far as new 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 and different ways to be able to do AI. Is that also incorporated to be able to say like, you know, on day one we start with this model and it runs through five different types of AI and machine learning, but then we're also going to, you know, open a slot to where, you know, maybe in the future, 
you know, something else comes along and then we can just. Yeah, you know, no, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for for sure. Well. If there's a new model that comes along, right? Yeah, you could try it. For example, uh, uh, for example, in the bit image processing world, right? Uh, uh, one of the models that we used uh, initially was something called YOLO V3. And now, you know, that's YOLO version five. You know, <laughs> these, these, I mean, and, and next year there'll be version six. And these are models that are built uh, not for drilling, but, you know, for general, you know, image recognition. And they keep improving. So, so in situations like this, yeah, you know, uh, they run faster, you know, uh, they train better. So you would have a training data set that you keep kind of you know, building, right? And then basically you would train the model on it. Even so, I mean, so for example, a drill bit image processing, that's not a high stakes kind of, you know, situation, right? I mean, uh, it's basically, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, this got damaged because of stick slip or, you know, well, you know, it's not the end of the world if, you know, you made a, make a bad uh, inference on that. Uh, whereas some others, right, for example, uh, uh, and also there's very little variation in drill bit image processing. Whereas if you want to kind of you know, talk about a step pipe event or basically hole cleaning, every well that's kind of, you know, drill this is different in some form or fashion, right? And so, uh, uh, and, and it's very difficult to collect all of this data realistically. Uh, and so uh, a lot of times you get meta models, right? That gets built mm -hmm. and then you get new data. And yeah, the, so uh, to answer your question, yes, if, if, there's, if some new radical thing comes, you know, you would want to kind of, you know, train it. And ha have another USB plug port, you know, yeah. for, to be able to just plug in the next thing. All right. Yeah. So we've got a lot more questions here that are uh, coming in. Um, so I'm not ignoring you guys at all with this, and I'm, I'm very happy that we're getting lots of questions. All right, so this is from John DeWard. Data quality, how can machine learning learn properly with some of the bad data or inaccurate data of unknown quality that we have in drawing? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So uh, uh, a lot of the times, right, uh, you can just feed bad data to the machine learning algorithms and it will filter out the algorithms will automatically filter out the noise. So, uh, uh, so you can essentially, you know, uh, 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 in a sense, right. Uh, one, one, one trick that you could do is basically, you know, take a good data set, right. And, uh, and remove a lot of the basically kind of, you know, uh, uh, channels, right. And train your model, right. And, and that model that you train, would be a lot more robust to bad data than a model that's basically just trained on good data. So, so a lot of the models kind of, you know, will automatically filter out as long as you incorporate the bad data into your, into your training. But of course you have to be concerned that, I mean, uh, you do have to kind of, you know, you got to look into the data a little bit more carefully. That's why I kind of, you know, showed that mud motor example, right? It's like, you know, if you don't bring in all the data, uh, you don't want to kind of think that your model will solve all the problems, right? Mm. So uh, uh, it's a uh, that's why you know uh, machine learning is uh, uh, you know you got to kind of you know, take it uh, look at it from different perspectives, right? It has to be used by somebody that somebody who uses it kind of you know needs to kind of you know trust in that, and uh, uh, so uh, you have to kind of you know basically uh, uh, work with them to kind of you know figure out what is the right uh, right level of, you know, complexity you want to add, but that's one way that you would actually handle a uh, bad data. All right. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Mahana Hamor. I think that's, it. So, sorry guys, if I butchered those names, it's just, it's just part of the, the game. Uh, tell us more about rapid projects, please. Yeah, uh, sure. So, so like I said, uh, rapid stands for, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, I do know Mahana. I've kind of, you know, uh, Worked with him. He's, oh, in, uh, okay. he's in Tehran. Uh, of course, I also knew John Dewar. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, so so Rapid is uh, uh, stands for Rig Automation of Performance Super Drilling, right? So basically, when Rapid was kind of started in 2015, we had four core topics that we decided to kind of work under, which is modeling and controls, uh, automation on the rig site, sensors, uh, basically uh, uh, developing and uh, prototyping sensors and uh, data analytics. So, so these four kind of you know, fall broadly under drilling automation. So uh, generally a rapid usually has uh, anywhere from, uh, from 10 to 20 members every year, depending on the year. Some years are good, some years are bad. 
uh, <laughs> and understandably, uh, industry yeah. yeah does that a yeah. little bit. And uh, so so we have around you know these twenty sponsors, and basically uh, we have uh, we have worked on close to around 25, 30 different projects on drilling automation, and uh, uh, all under this umbrella. And now we have also started kind of you know, including a fifth pillar, which is basically the geothermal. So, oh, excellent. Uh, uh, so geothermal uh, and you know a little bit of you know carbon sequestration, sustainability, kind of you know bringing all that in along with uh, the drilling automation. That we do. Excellent. All right, guys. If y'all have any more questions about Rapid, be sure to throw them out. All right. Next up, uh, Calvin Hall. Automation will reduce personnel on site and people on board, just like it happened with flying. What used to take three to six crew to fly a bomber? Uh, or passenger plane, it cannot be done with two. Aviation has a shortage of pilots, so maybe drilling will run short of drillers. Question mark. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, so uh, so in generally, you know, the oil and gas industry is always going to be shrinking, right? Because we are going to figure out how to drill more efficiently. So uh, 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 it won't it won't shrink, you know, all the way, but it will it will become actually more and more efficient. Where basically on the on the rig side, you'd have fewer people kind of, you know, uh, there and a lot of people kind of, you know, doing a lot of the other stuff, like, you know, basically uh, the remote monitoring and such. So, yeah, I mean, uh, 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 I can see that I can see that happening. Uh, of course, you know, uh, right now, uh, there's also a shortage of, you know, people to work in this industry, right? So uh, uh, you can get a job today very easily yes. uh, i don't know uh, i i don't kind of you know have that uh, capacity but yeah people can easily find you don't jobs. want to be a roughneck yeah i think i'm a little too old for that right now <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no uh but do you think that also exacerbates the problem of saying like okay we don't have enough people we can't get people in here so now we need a technology or robotics or something to be able to make up for the fact that we can't hire people yeah, no, no, uh, that is true. But uh, but again, this industry kind of, you know, traditionally always tries to go cheap, right? And so uh, uh, so uh, that and in doing so, uh, basically the biggest risk is on safety side, right? Essentially, uh, when people are not, not trained sufficiently to kind of, you know, work, right? So these days, you know, the same problems keep coming up, you know, uh, washout, stuck pipe, you know, uh, that, you know, used to come, you know, back in the days, right? So uh, uh, the industry is moving forward and uh, uh, eventually, uh, at least in the U.S., right, uh, uh, it'll get a lot more uh, streamlined. Um, uh, so we'll see how it goes. All right. All right. Next one here uh, from the bit winner to uh, Vod. I think that's right. What are your thoughts about ML? So I guess machine learning ops in oil and gas, how can we streamline better software skills across citizen data scientists? Yeah, no. Uh, so basically, uh, I think these days, uh, most of the uh, uh, youngsters, I mean, I'm talking about people uh, between 20 and 40, right? I mean, they are kind of, you know, uh, uh, very familiar with, you know, programming languages like Python, or they may not know Python, but they're familiar with it. And uh, uh, basically, getting started in data science is not difficult. There are so many online kind of you know tutorials and courses to kind of you know uh, leverage. Uh, what I was kind of you know trying to kind of you know basically talk about today was that you know uh, getting started is not difficult. You just have to think about building models or programs that actually get used. Don't just kind of you know build models that you know. You can kind of you know, say, hey, you know, I built this, you know, nobody will use it, but it's kind of, you know, it's cool. <laughs> so, uh, so we, so we do need to kind of, you know, uh, uh, train them. And basically, uh, uh, all of the education kind of, you know, uh, programs such as these and SPE, right? They help kind of, you know, uh, get, uh, get that forward. And so, I mean, with regards to software skills, uh, yeah, it, it's very much dependent on the, uh, on the company that, you know, uh, they are working in, right? A lot of companies, uh, they have their own data science kind of you know teams right working on a lot of different uh, projects uh, one thing uh, that's actually uh, uh, a pet peeve of mine is essentially uh, you know it's like a uh, in a lot of these companies the data scientists right they get put on kind of you know, very simple problems right which you know have been kind of you know, done by this industry for you know 
uh, again, more than half a century, like, you know, hey, you know, write a kick detection algorithm. Hey, write a rig stage detection algorithm. Hey, you know, talk and drag, swab and search. Okay, you know, that's that's all kind of, you know, done. So so uh, people keep just kind of, you know, going in continuous loops of, you know, doing the same thing again and again, instead of leveraging what's out there and going the next level up, right? So uh, this industry has that problem that, you know, they don't, they feel like they want to kind of, you know, build everything themselves. So uh, so we'll see how it goes. Again, uh, I don't know exactly how uh, bad that will go, but hopefully, you know, uh, people start kind of you know, building better uh, widgets. All right. <laughs> Advanced widgets, not, Advanced not, widgets. The, not the little ones. Yeah. Could you please give us some more insight on model selection procedure for prediction problems? From Rami, Rumi? Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, that 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 was the prime uh, uh, thing that I kind of you know covered in this in this presentation is that you know uh, when you're selecting a model, you're going to understand who's going to use it, right? <clears throat> uh, is it uh, so? So if it's somebody who is kind of you know very cynical about AI and machine learning, then you have to basically make sure that the model is understandable. You cannot go with a black box because you know you're doomed to fail. Now. Uh, uh, with regards to uh, accuracy, understand that you know you can never be hundred percent accurate in your prediction. So you have to basically tell your end user that hey, you know, uh, it's gonna it's gonna give you help, right? It's not it's not you know it's not gonna you can tell you no, know, it's not gonna replace you, and it will require your kind of you know insights. But take their kind of you know basically insights into building the model, and then uh, uh, false alerts, you know, in drilling, they are very bad. So, uh, uh, so if you can minimize that, you know, that would be good. Uh, then the other things I covered are also kind of, you know, applicable is, you know, when you're, when you're selecting a model, think about, Hey, you know, is this extensible, right? I mean, if new data comes in or think about the pipeline and, and, uh, and also think about basically, uh, uh, the person who would come after you, right? It's like, you know, maybe you want to work on, you know, uh, some uh, some cool algorithm you know right now but three years later you know you become the manager right and uh, and then you know who's going to work on the algorithm that you kind of you know develop right so so you need to make it such that essentially uh, there is something for the next data scientist right uh, to kind of you know, build on right so so those are kind of the key things that i would kind of you know uh, basically say uh, you got to give thought to when you think about model selection and, and you do need to think about model selection. Don't just kind of, you know, uh, if you saw a news article that says, Hey, you know, they've come up with YOLO V7, don't go jump and kind of, you know, pick that up for your project. Yeah. So what about the idea of, you know, like you said, the explainability of it, if you're working with somebody who's, you know, um, I don't, I don't want to say anti, uh, you know, AI machine learning, but somebody who's skeptical. Yeah. yeah. Right. Would it be the, a good, idea then to be able to have you know uh, kind of like building a model in parallel where you have one of them where you've got the decision tree on there and you can kind of be able to you explain it a little bit better and as that starts to get accepted but at the mm -hmm. same time have something that's more um black box on the other side that's a little bit harder to explain but you know Oh yeah, you no. know, and so as you go along, you're showing here, like, okay, hey, you know, we're having success with this one, but this one, like, is like the next level up. Yeah. Have you guys done that, or have you have you gone through that process? Yeah, no, no. We, we, so, so, teach? so we can always kind of do that, right? Basically, you know, that's that's the uh, that's some things that you know some platforms have an advantage of, right? It's like you know, uh, if you have you know three different AI models, right? Uh, you can have them running parallelly in the platform, right? And then if two of the models say, hey, no, this is happening, you stand a higher chance that, you know, basically, you know, that actually is happening, right? So, yes, you know, you can have a, a, a distant tree and you can have a black box and, you know, uh, the the combined effect of those two would be better, right? If you have three, you know, then at least you have, uh, you have a better chance of you know, a voting arrangement. But, of course, one thing you have to remember is that each model takes resources, right? So, uh, so you got to kind of, you know, uh, you can just throw a whole bunch of money Right. You may have money to kind of you know, say, OK, you know, I'll have, you know, kick detection algorithm. You know, you work on this, you work on this, you work on this. Right. And you got to think about keeping that funded for 10 years. So uh, so it, it's all money. Right. I mean, how much do you want to spend? Right. What are the returns? Right. But yes, you know, definitely if you have more models. Right. 
uh, you can kind of, you know, have uh, best would be to have at least three models, all good, you know, all different approaches. And then, you know, there's some kind of a voting arrangement that basically says, okay, now this is what's happening. I can really see where that could get tough because just a simple fact in anything that is like twist off detection or, uh, you know, stuck pipe detection or any of those, it's like, if you drill a well and you never have an incident, yeah, right. And then it's like, you know, or, you know, we prevented it from happening or, or we detected something, you know, you slowed down and then it's like, well, how do you actually know that you're preventing it from, from taking place yeah, without yeah. that actual incident taking place? So then yeah. it becomes, a, you know, then the sales proposition becomes it's an insurance policy. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, no, how, no. Do we, how do we know it's working until we stop using it and then have a problem? Yeah, no, no, exactly. No, that's also why, you know, uh, uh, it's very difficult to sell AI, right? It's like, no, okay, yeah, I know. Uh, uh, the, the only way you can kind of, you know, do it is some companies, you know, uh, they basically say, hey, you know, we'll use this for a year, right? And then, you know, the previous year, they're like, okay, we had this many incidents this year, uh, um, previous year, like, you know, 20 stock pipes, right? And then this year we have two stock pipes and we can credit that too. So that's one way you can do it, right? I mean, that's, that, that's you know, but it requires a longer term. It's not like, you know, hey, you know, basically a one, uh, a one well kind of thing. But also, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes, you know, this industry is very much fond of free, right? Uh, so, yes. so, uh, so free for one year is not realistic. So, uh, uh, right. So, so it kind of depends, but uh, uh, if somebody were to do that, they would definitely kind of, you know, see benefits, but we also need to kind of track it as, you know, people involved. But the key question is, you know, uh, how to make it cost efficient. We don't want to kind of, you know, have an AI algorithm and like three people looking to see that the AI algorithm is working. Right. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so, uh, so those are all kind of, you know, some of the, uh, and then I can also see instances within our industry to where if that you went from 20 down to two, yeah, then there would definitely be somebody within that industry that says, or within that organization says, oh, it was because of our drilling practices. Now we have better drilling practices. We don't need the system anymore. And we go back to drilling and then, then it becomes a person, like maybe they do fine for six months. But then as the turnover starts to take place or, you know, people aren't watching it the same and then all of a sudden the problem comes back. Yeah, yeah, and then they're like, well, we ran this thing and then it got rid of it, but then they all came back, but they didn't realize it came back when they stopped using it. Anyways, yeah, that, yeah, that's, no, that's, yeah, that's a rant of my own. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So John Dahl says, uh, all tools developed should help the crews do their best work every time. If the system improves their decisions and actions, it will be welcome and provide them the time to focus on other needs in their roles should be a win-win for everyone involved. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. No, no, it's no, kind of no, hard no. to disagree with that yeah. one. <laughs> all right, uh, Brian, I don't even know if we, oh yeah, it all. Uh, with mud motor, there is a proper fit and elastomer type with each temperature range and mud type. The stator chunking is part mud motor setup and part surface slash downhole parameters. You could use AI to determine the best rotor stator combination based on past motor performance. We did this manually or with custom software to pick from what is available. Being what is available is actually a pretty important thing during the industry right now. Uh, was there any, what were some of the conclusions that you guys came up with? On no, yeah, I mean, else, uh, uh, so, so what Brian is saying is, is right, right? I mean, you can kind of, you know, uh, uh, if you understand the mud motor, right? You can basically kind of, you know, if you know this mud motor specifications, you can better build systems that, uh, uh, are more accurate. But the key questions is, you know, you need to understand what the mud temperature is downhole, right? You need to know what the mud properties are, which is very difficult to cut today, kind of, you know, uh, make it flow to an algorithm that's processing the data, right? I mean, the mud temperature, you know, uh, most drilling operations, you know, you don't get it. And uh, you need to, you need to predict the downhole temperature, right? And essentially, you know, if you stop circulation, you know, temperature increases. So you need, it's, it's not a very straightforward problem, even though you know that, hey, you know, the mud temperature, uh, this works best in this mud temperature range and uh, this mud type. But if you know that information, you can, you should definitely include it into the model. And the study that we did, right, did not include it because we didn't have the data because 
the data is historical and when the data was collected you know they didn't think of a need to collect it and of course uh, again it's basically an insurance policy right i mean if you go to your manager and say hey you know we want to prevent mud motor failures in the future so we need to collect this data they'll be like hmm, do you really need to collect the data right so essentially uh, but yeah i mean uh, uh, if you are collecting that data it can help and uh, uh, there are some of course you know uh, i know osdu is one effort you know that's actually happening to kind of you know collect more data but that's you know uh, uh, that's a big project so you know yeah. it's very difficult for me to kind of say when exactly something will come out of it right so i don't uh, think anybody can predict that one yeah 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 <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, i think you know uh, data will start flowing a little bit easier uh, not i mean in, in, may, in maybe another 2 3 years and so again think long term you know things are improving even though in short term kind of you know we are all frustrated that hey you know nothing seems to be improving long term things are improving so that's that's good excellent all right uh so Mahana says, appreciate your effort for such valuable sessions, David Pradeep. Thank you. Uh, it says, I hope to see more sessions in the near future. And uh, Johnny says, sorry, I'm late. He got here extremely late. <laughs> so, well, anything else you want to share? Anything else that you'd like to be able to tell everybody? No, I mean, uh, uh, the the key thing to, I guess, in, uh, in AI and machine learning world is basically, you know, think ahead. You know, and uh, uh, AI and machine learning is coming to drilling, right? I mean, uh, actually, I, I already think that it's a little bit mature. You know, these days, when you go talk about AI and machine learning to kind of you know, somebody on the rig, you know, they don't look at you like you're crazy. They're like, <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, yeah, we have heard about it. And, you know, so, uh, uh, so and, and as people get used to AI outside of drilling, right? Uh, and machine learning outside of drilling, right? Then they become more receptive to kind of, you know, look into it. So uh, uh, it is a good field to be in. And in general, I think, you know, petroleum engineering is really a great field to be in. Uh, I know uh, uh, a lot of people have a lot of misgivings about, hey, you know, what's going to happen to petroleum engineering kind of, you know, field in the future, right? Are we going to, you know, get taken over by, you know, some other kind of, you know, uh, yeah, whatever it is, right? And, uh, and that's not true, right? I mean, uh, 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 we know that, you know, uh, a lot of the other energies can't replace yet, maybe nuclear, right? But uh, geothermal, we are working on it, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And in the meantime, uh, uh, I think a lot of petroleum engineers feel that, you know, uh, at least the youngsters, they feel like, you know, they're basically kind of, you know, uh, doing bad to earth, but that's not the truth. And so, uh, uh, Fossil fuels, as you know, kind of, you know, basically kind of, you know, help uh, uh, increase life expectancy in a lot of the uh, uh, developing nations and the third world countries, right? And so uh, it's got a huge uh, ramifications. It's just that, you know, basically uh, it's got bad PR right now, but... Uh, we're trying to change that. Yeah, but we're trying to change that. And essentially, you know, uh, uh, just read up and, you know... Uh, Know that that's a good future for petroleum engineering, and you're doing good. <laughs> I, I got one more question. What is the next big thing to tackle on the drilling side with AI and ML? It's so obviously not kick detection or uh, washout detection. What's what's the next big challenge to really be able to overcome? So, I mean, uh, I think that you know, uh, okay. So, so my perspective, most of the, I mean, I don't think that's any major challenge to overcome. I think we have been working on a lot of problems, right? Those problems need to kind of, you know, reach a level of maturity, solutions, right? I mean, kick detection, stuck pipe, you know, we've been working on it for a long time. They do need to reach a level of maturity where people say, okay, you know, it's like, you know, okay, yeah, uh, I'll use that. Uh, the only thing, I mean, the, what I'm really, of course, you know, interested in is basically uh, interactive AI, where uh, you are able to essentially, like I said, you know, through the uh, driller memos, right? communicate with the AI system, get feedback. That is interesting. Uh, uh, I think that will kind of, you know, bring a lot of sophistication on the rig site. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a challenge, right? I mean, it's, are people kind of asking for it? No, but uh, it's like, you know, uh, where people asking for, you know, Google Maps and, you know, the ability to say, hey, you know, I want to find a Starbucks on the way, no. But, yeah. but once it comes, Henry you know, Ford said, it. you know, if yeah. I would ask people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, I think interactive AI is, uh, is the most kind of, you know, uh, 
interesting to me. It's like, you know, uh, you can do that outside of the drilling. So why not? Right. And that does require quite a bit of, you know, things to kind of, you know, come together, mostly data flow. And, uh, and today, uh, most of the companies are still kind of, you know, very kind of, you know, uh, uh, very stingy when it comes to kind of, you know, pushing data from their system to a different system, right? It's like, oh, the data is in this, uh, in this software, you know, we will not let it go to that software. So, uh, uh, but, uh, but once somebody cracks that, right, uh, then, you know, uh, a lot of things that we're talking about becomes possible and, and it will happen. So. Excellent. Well, what Brian says, thanks, David. Well, thank you for tuning in, Brian. I appreciate that. All right. And then hi, pretty great seeing you after uh, you after long years. I'm hey, you, good seeing you, man. <laughs> I'm guessing you know who that is. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so, yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, pretty, thank you so much yeah. for being on the show. Yeah. I really do appreciate it. Uh, everybody like, share, subscribe, do all the social media things. Um, try to think um, we'll be I, I will be at SPATCE next week, Tuesday, Wednesday uh, for that. And then Thursday is the uh, ISC WSA Industry Steering Committee for Well Bore Survey Accuracy will have our, um, our 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 day long conference or event. I don't know what we we'll call it. A uh, meeting. That's what we we'll call it. We'll have our meeting on Thursday if you want to be able to attend. Lots of people in the direction of drilling and survey space will be there. We'll also be voting for Treasury Secretary and Directors at Large. Uh, I'm not up for election. I already won last time, so um this one will be for for new directors at large uh so please uh if you want to be able to come attend be able to vote for the people that will be on the board and kind of moving the group forward uh if you do see me at atc next week be sure to stop by say hi you're gonna be there next yeah. week are you presenting yeah. yeah oh what session are you what uh, I, I don't know what session it's on the last day uh i'm going to be talking about uh motor stall detection so uh uh uh, that, that's again a research that we did at uh, at UT. Uh, uh, just you know, uh, uh, basically, yeah, basically, you know, for the most part, right? I mean, motor stalls, right? You know, people are kind of you know, guessing that it's a motor stall, right? I mean, there's a differential pressure spike, and you know, hey, you know, that must be a motor stall. Uh, because of rapid and because of our sponsors, we have downhole data sets where we can see the stalls happening, and we have surface data sets, and so basically, uh, we were able to correlate them, and we have come up with an approach to in a more robust fashion, detect starts just from surface data. So, um, so that would be a, an interesting paper. All right. So I guess we're going to have to have you come back on the show and be able to present that. Oh, come as, to ATC, as, right? I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, okay. yeah for sure. Yeah. Go to ATCE first, but then, you know, maybe afterwards we'll see how it goes and maybe yeah. even have you come back on the show oh, and, sure, and yeah. talk about motor stalls. Cause we do have a, a big, uh, drilling audience here. So thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, Pete says really like the notion of introducing AI based alerts as help versus an absolute uh thank you for a good talk and some interesting ideas uh pete thanks for watching do appreciate it um and then john Dwarf says thanks for the talk very interesting uh john, john. former guest on the show that you know obviously both of us know all right everybody uh thank you guys so much for for watching and being a part of this um please do me one favor and just share the show uh either the post or just talk to somebody, let them know about the show. Um, you know, want to be able to continue to grow this and be able to have presentations like this that are beneficial to everybody in the industry. Um, so with that, let me make sure I get this done right. Uh, thank you guys all for being here. And as I always say, know your industry.